My name is Anastasia Kazakova and I'm working for the company named JetBrains. Uh, so I'm here to talk about how we feel about C++ and how we look at it uh, as a tool developers, as the persons who do IDEs actually for the languages. Uh, so talking about my background just a little bit, uh, uh, the important thing here is that I was developing in C++ for eight years, mostly doing some embedded development, networking stuff, and all the things. And then I came to JetBrains, and I'm actually not doing development, like direct development f uh, for the tools in JetBrains, uh, but mostly actually talking about the tools, showing them to the community. So, But the important thing here is that uh, once my colleague who is actually sitting here, he mentioned that um, before he has actually came to JetBrains, he never uh, learned the language that deeply as when he actually joined the JetBrains and started doing a tool for the actual language. And that's true. So well, uh, while I was working in C++, I was like developing in C++ for that many years, I never referred to the language in that many details. I never considered that many things in the language that could be there because I actually didn't see the whole uh, range of the projects in C++, the whole range of abilities because you are always limited to some tools, to some standards that are like uh, used in the company, to whatever. And when you started doing a tool, you see like the whole world uh, and you see lots of projects, you see the whole range, and you understand how big is it and actually how tricky is it. So uh, before starting talking about the language itself, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, this kind of a triangle that is developer language and tools and why actually each point here is important and the most important thing is a collaboration here between all three. So uh, if we actually took the, uh, take the developers, we uh, could think in the following day that like, uh, unlike for example school students who I was actually teaching previously and I was trying not to uh, give them any kind of the tools so that they could try everything from scratch and try themselves to implement themselves. But if we uh, are talking about developers who are doing some kind of a, uh, production code, uh, they could not uh, go this way, so they have to take the tools, uh, the language, whatever they can, so that they could be the most productive. So they couldn't afford trying everything from scratch and implemented everything themselves. Uh, if we talk about the language, so um, I strongly believe that actually there is a language for each area. I don't believe in some kind of a general language. Uh, so, but I think that uh, one developer takes a proper language for the proper area. Uh, the developers, uh, they still need tools because language without tools uh, is a kind of poor because there, is, there should be something that will be supporting the language features. So if we take, for example, formatting uh, for the language, and so if we don't have any tool that supports it, most likely the developers will try to skip to avoid from it because it's quite difficult to have everything in your mind to keep to some formatting guides, to some core guidelines, to whatever. So you have to at least rely on something that will be doing at least some part of the job for you so that you can focus on the more important stuff. So uh, the tools uh, are here in this triangle actually to support developers from one side to eliminate shortages of the languages, at least uh, to the level they can, and actually to follow and respect developers' needs uh, in uh, like in their processes. So uh, if we um, talk about IDEs in particular, like uh, I will be talking here about language tools that are IDEs. So, and if you ask someone what is the most important thing that they are actually expecting from the IDE, uh, first of all, they will definitely tell you about correctness. I've heard it for many, many times, and it all starts with correctness. They say like, I would like to have a 100% correct, uh, correct IDE so that it could understand the language correctly. But uh, when they start thinking more, they come to actually uh, more things they would like to have uh, from the tool. So they say like, I would like to have performance because I don't want the tool to do something and I will be just drinking a coffee and waiting for, I don't know, for my completion for 10 seconds. That just, uh, you couldn't afford that. You will just go and take some kind of a text editor and code because you could not just wait after each operation. Um, 
If we talk about uh, IDE, so the people are actually expecting the smartness. So they expect the IDE to be more smart than the text editor. They would like to have some uh, code intelligence working on the fly so that they don't have to push it specifically. Uh, the people are actually expecting the tool to be universal in terms that they want the tool to know about the whole project, not about just one file that they just opened. And they want them actually to be helpful in terms of the incorrect code, because um, unlike compilers and many other tools, you are just when you start writing a code, you have at some point you have an incorrect code. And if the IDE just blows away with that in that very moment, that's just uh, not very good. So you, you need to continue coding, you need to do things, and the IDE need just to handle somehow that the code could be incorrect in some points in, uh, in time. And of course, people are expecting as many as they like uh, know about the uh, language ecosystem to be built in in their particular IDE, because like usually you've got lots of requests, and I want this tool, I want this tool, and that tool. So they would like to have lots of them on board. So you see, there is quite a long list, and sometimes it's not uh, clear how to actually make everyone happy. And even it's not clear if you just take the correctness and performance. And especially for C++, which I'm going to tell um, uh, in more details later. So the problem here is that when we take the IDE and we take uh, just the correctness and performance, it's always the uh, question of some kind of a balance. Uh, to make a 100% correct IDE, it could be possible, but it mostly likely will kill the whole performance if it's more or less uh, like big and usable project. So it's not just a game project where you just started to play with the language. So, um, and actually there are more things that we have to keep in mind, uh, talking about the ID and our reality actually, in which we do as a, like a tool vendors, we live in this reality. So, um, the ID it actually has to deal with different codes. So as I said, the whole range of projects is actually uh, could be opened in the tool. So we have to deal with some legacy code. We have to deal with the uh, the whole language baggage that we have like for these 40 years already, even more than 40 years. So and also the people will be coming for the modern features. So for the features that just appeared in the like C++ 14, C++ 17, upcoming standards technical specification, they don't mind that the feature maybe is not in the standard yet. They just want it. They want to use it. They, they feel that they can benefit from it. And I don't see any reason why the IDE should prevent them from this experience. So, but from the, at the same moment, we have to deal with the legacy code and this kind of a very modern code that's maybe even not standard, uh, standardized. So, and they have to coexist. And that's the issue. So you could not just say like, okay, we'll be using this uh, like standard and all these kind of uh, things that you have previously just throwing them away. We couldn't afford that. And the incorrect code that I was actually talking um, the, on the previous slide is also a thing here. And if we compare the IDE to the compiler, which is maybe the most popular language tool that everyone is just comparing usually the IDE to, um, the issue here is that the main issue is that they have different goals. So with a compiler, your main goal is just to compile your project to get the executable that you have to run or debug or whatever, so to do your job. Uh, with the IDE, the main task for the IDE is to help you to provide you some support in talent sense as quickly as it could. So that's the point. So not to deal with the whole project at this very moment, but somehow to uh, to show you some completion or to highlight your code or to format your code at this very moment, at this very file. But it has it's still to know all the information about the whole project, especially for C++, and I'll show it later. So, uh, and of course, the error recovery level is completely different because uh, in com the compiler, it just stops. If it uh, just uh, meets the incorrect code, it simply stops. It says, okay, so you have an error here. I will stop at this very point. And with ID, you can afford that. You have to proceed somehow. So um, I'm actually here talking about these things, uh, not only because we would like to share some kind of a pain and excitement we have about the language and some new features uh, that could actually help, but uh, because uh, one reason is that 
knowledge is power. So if you know why you, the code could break in the IDE, you could maybe uh, help yourself somehow or uh, just think about if you do things in a good way or maybe that's not a good way in general. And that's why the IDE fails. And actually, I hope that there are people here, um, like in C++ now and any other conference that I could present this talk to, uh, that are working in the uh, C++ language committee, and they could keep some things in the back of their mind when they are thinking about new features. So before we start, let's just play a very quick C++ game. Um, so here's the code, um, and you see that in the end of this uh, test function, I have two lines looking completely the same, nearly the same. Um, but they are different. And I guess you could just uh, find the difference quite quickly here. So um, the story here is that the first line is the template, uh, and the first line is the binary expression. But you see, the looks. Can you just point with the mouse for cursor which line you mean? Yeah, so this is the first line. and. Uh, Oh, I think it's not. OK, so I will just uh, read it. So the first line with X is a template. And the second line with uh, is a binary expression. But they look the same. Um, OK, let's go forward. I like such examples a lot. So I have another example here. It's not that similar, like the two lines uh, with aggregate and uh, this X, uh, X with Z. Uh, is not really the same, but are very similar. And what are they? Actually, there is a constructor with parameter x in the first line with agric, and the second line is a variable z with type x. So, you know, they are actually different, but they look very similar. Um, I like the game. I will play a little bit more. Um, let's take the example. So I have auto, that is x minus 5, and b, that is aggregate minus 5. But is it really so? Actually, the first line, so that is about a, is a cast. And the second line with b is an expression. Um, and now let's think a little bit more about what we see here. So we, what we do, actually, when we're trying to understand what each line means, we tried to read some code that was above and tried to find out what this actually means. And what we mostly do, we try to distinguish if what we see is a type or a non-type. And that's the main point for C++ parsing. To parse C++, you have to understand if what you see is a type or non-type. And that's actually a problem, because to do that, you have to resolve the whole code. You have to read quite a lot of it to understand what's going on there. So it's not this simple in terms of parsing the code. And this sample I really like a lot because what it shows is that I have two lists, like two lines here. The first one is a list of declarations, and the second one is a list of expressions. And to understand that, you actually have to read these lines until the very end, because only there I could see, for example, if I take the second line, so I see new int, and here I could guess that they, I'm just making an object and so just put in the heap memory so and getting the pointer back. So and only reading this new int, I got that all the what was previously, that's just the list of expressions. And the problem is that this is some kind of in, infinite look ahead. So the line could be as long as the input is. So, and you have to read it until the very end. Of course, uh, like if we talk about IDs, they do lots of tricks. So they could like uh, find this out quite quickly to understand what's going on there and so on and so forth. But I'm not talking about technical details in how the ID copes with the exact problem. The problem is here that with C++, you have to not only to parse the code, but to resolve the code. Because it's impossible in C++ to parse the code without actually resolve it, without actually understanding what is there, a type or a non-type. Um, so let's uh, think about it a little bit more and try to get why actually it's important. Uh, if we keep in mind the examples that I was shown previously, we could understand that we actually need this information to highlight and format the code. 
That's the very first thing. So while you type in the code, the code needs to be highlighted in the editor. It needs to be formatted properly. But the IDE to do that, uh, it actually has to resolve the whole code to do that properly. Because for example, like uh, if we take the formatting and if we take the example with templates and binary, uh, like an expression, like you most likely you have some kind of a spaces between the angle brackets or they're highlighted differently uh, in comparison to template. And to do that automatically in the tool, the tool has to understand the difference. And there are actually coming more things like if you have the completion, like you press some button and you're waiting for uh, some kind of a completion list, if you are doing some kind of a navigation or whatever, but that's actually the second list is something that you are actually calling explicitly. But the first thing is just the thing that is happening in the background in your tool. So let's talk a little bit more on uh, what actual result depends on. And if we Think about C++, so it's quite easy, actually. First of all, is the order of the definition. So in the first part, like the first function call is just uh, nothing because we don't have it. The first function call resolves correctly. So the IDE has to like figure out where the actual uh, declaration was. So a little bit more tricky example is the default arguments. So the first example, uh, like the first fun uh, function uh, fun function um, call, it's actually have uh, has like too few arguments from our point of view, like because it doesn't have the uh, declaration like that. And with the second function call, it's better because we have the default argument uh, version. So, and the problem is that this could be in different files. This could spread among your whole project. So, okay, and of course there is overload resolution. Uh, so there is nothing like tricky about it in general, like it's just a set of rules, but the IDE has to find all the pieces and to like go for all the rules here. And again, it could be spread among the whole project for you. Um, let's take a very simple problem here. So let's take the highlighting. Could we highlight with the Luxor for C++? <coughs> How do you think? Yeah, I see you know, and that's correct. So you could not. And I will show you just a couple of examples. So first of all, Let's take the angle brackets. So if you take the C++ before uh, C++11, this kind of a string that is as, uh, as int, it will be ill-formed uh, because it will uh, be uh, saying you that you have to have a space uh, between consecutive uh, right angle brackets here because it could not deal with it correctly. So after C++11, the things got better. So uh, the compilers, uh, they started understanding what's going on there. And we had some kind of a rule um, written down in the standard how to deal with them, where do you find the template, whatever. So, but what does that mean for uh, actual IDE? The IDE has to, while highlighting the code, trying to highlight you, for example, template instantiation or like just the angle brackets that is uh, greater than operator in a proper way, it has to understand what is actually going on there. Um, yeah, so if you, for example, would like to highlight or to play some spaces automatically or whatever. And there are actually even a simpler example here. So could I highlight uh, the keywords on Alexa? And I could not, because here I have uh, actually, um, there is a public keyword but it's not a public keyword. It's actually a variable public public. And to know that, I have to go to this macros and to understand what it's actually doing and to understand that that's not a keyword. So, and that actually breaks the highlighting with Alexor. So I couldn't do that. Um, let's take some bigger and a little bit more complicated example and talk about uh, some kind of highlighting and code inspection, so code analysis. So uh, if you have uh, the piece of code like this here uh, and you take the two lines at the bottom, so that is A and B declaration here. So for A, there should be an error because that's actually incorrect line because what I have uh, here on the right is uh, on the left, sorry, is not a type. And what you all are doing here, and I see it in your eyes, so you do the following, you take uh, like S1 and S2, you take foo, trying to understand what is foo from S1 and foo from S2, you try to find the proper template, and you know what? The ID has to do the same job. 
it has to go through the whole code here and to understand if I got actually a type finally here or not. And so for the uh, line with S2 where the, there is a B declaration, I got a proper type and in the first line I don't get a type so I should somehow highlight the error here with the ID. Um, so are the things that bad actually? And the answer is no. And the good things here is the thing that we really are hoping for is concepts. And why do we? Because the concept could actually provide some additional information for us and say that like uh, here you get this, this type and here uh, you could get this type or whatever information you could put into the concept and like reading these things we could understand how it, how it actually should be highlighted properly or whatever. So it could, it could help. And we could actually try to cache some things or to do whatever that could, we could do to optimize the whole performance and it really could be a great solution to the problem. And what I really like about the concept is that the core guidelines are pushing them heavily and if you open the, um, in the core guidelines the um, parts regarding the templates, it's full of concepts. It's talking about the concept in each line and that's great I think. And it's not great from the point of ID only, it's great from the point of like the readability of your code and that's what like actual reasoning in the core guidelines starts with each time you're talking about the templates is that you, you probably see that they have this kind of reason, uh, reason for each point and it often starts with the readability reason and that's actually great. So and if your code is readable in that sense, it's actually readable like and understandable by the ID much easier. Um, okay, so with concept, that means that we could get some uh, additional information and uh, we could try and cache something to optimize the performance and more important, we could try and provide some intelligence inside the template. That is actually quite tricky because when you're like writing a template, there is some piece of code there that is just like a text for the ID, what's going on there, how it could guess what's going on in this template. But if you get some kind of a concept that, for example, saying that I will be calling these things there and they will be like, it should be some uh, function like that and it should return this type, we could at least guess something. We could provide you some intelligence. Okay, that was about the concepts. Um, let's think about other problems that are here. Uh, not only about uh, how we should like parse and resolve the code, but let's talk about the functions in C++. Um, and in particular, I will be talking about the function bodies. So the thing here is that the forms actually most of the user code. So most of your code is actually living inside function bodies. And if we talk about the ideal world, usually nothing escapes to the outer code and the function bodies are quite independent. But is it really so for C++? And the answer is no, because it's not. And in this very simple example, so you have the outer return, and that means that if you call a function to understand actually what was returned from this function, you have to go and parse the function body. So you could not postpone parsing the function body until you actually get there and start typing there. You have to parse it just to understand what is returned from the call. Um, it could be a little bit easier with decal type, so we could get some information out of there, but what is the real solution here? And from our point of view, it would be quite a good thing if we got a if const expert here. Why so? Let's take a look at a very um, simple example. So I have a get value function here that just return um, if the t is not a pointer, it just returns the t value. If it's a pointer, it just takes the value under the pointer. So and here I actually got two functions with this enable ifs and the ID actually has when it actually sees the call of the function it has to go here to understand to somehow interpret this enable ifs to deal with this line to understand which uh, function to select so to do all the just the general stuff but could we do quicker could we just somehow eliminate this uh, issue with uh, interpreting uh, all the function signature here we actually could because we could do something like that. We could hide these details into the function body. Uh, this sample is maybe not that good because it still returns outer and as I said previously, this could be an issue. But if you just got some 
other type that is some exact type here, uh, it actually feels better. And even just with the outer, it, in terms of ID performance, it feels much better than interpreting the whole function signature each time it needs to understand what's going on there. Um, okay, so that was about function um, bodies. So, and now let's, uh, let's come to the most painful thing for C++, and that's the, yeah? A question about the function body sure. trees. It's a couple of slides before, one, one, one more. Here? Yes. Okay. So inside of the function foo, we have structure x, and if we declare a structure y inheriting from x, and one branch of the function will be returning x, another branch of the function will be returning y, then what will be deducted type for order? For return type? Don't, don't you know on top of my, or you might, or will that compile at all? Um, I guess no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the question was, if we just play a little bit more tricky game and have some, uh, type inherited from x, yeah, if I got it correctly, and return in some branch return x, in some branch return x. So you'd better don't do that, <laughs> really. Um, uh, because really, uh, you don't know what the type will be returned in the end, so, and. So, but, but they both are uh, having common parent class that they can be ex implicitly cast to. Yeah, and you know, the, the problem is not in, um, what exactly you're returning from out of here. The problem is that you don't know until you get into the function body. And I could uh, implement even more tricky example inside this function, returning whatever you can, inherit it in a very um, tricky way. But the question here is that to understand that you need to parse the function body. And that's actually the thing that we would like to avoid because it takes lots of time. So um, let's come to uh, includes in C++. So what's the issue? The issue is that they are just the text includes, actually. Uh, and so they just provide some information for the parser, so we have to go to this text includes to find what's, uh, what's actually defined there. And if I just uh, take the example uh, that I was showing previously, like when we were playing a game, and I just put the uh, extract, uh, like this kind of template, to the header file. So that means that I have to go to this header file to understand what's inside and to parse these two lines with X and it correctly. Um, but it's not the biggest problem. So they are also affected by the context. So you see, I just spoiled my example a little bit. And so now the result actually depends on the magic value. So there is some magic, actually, that could be defined somewhere. And depending on what, uh, actually, if it was defined or not, I got the different results for x. OK. And so that means that we have to find like all the context that is influencing our current uh, include. And the third point is quite obvious. So C++ is not Java, it's good. But C++ is not Java in terms of includes and imports. And that may be not that good. Because like when you are importing something in Java, you always know what you are actually importing. You know all the names, you know all the objects that are coming, you know all the uh, actual interface that is going to be used. And OK, and the story here is that all the things usually takes most of the time together with like function bodies. So you have lots of includes usually, and they are usually including the same things in multiple translation unit. And there is like include boost that includes the whole world, I guess, together with it. So what are the good ways to deal with? So first of uh, first solution is quite obvious. That's pre-compiled heaters that are really good in terms of uh, build time uh, for you and how you actually work with the project because you can just compile once and use it multiple times. And the second thing is that it's good for us because we could work with pre-compiled heaters quicker and um, we could uh, like cache some symbols, uh, some light, uh, lightweight stuff and just reuse it later. Um, but what if you couldn't use the pre-compiled heaters? It's not always an option. So. The second thing here is that global includes are much better than the local includes because the local includes are more affected by the context usually. So because you have all these defines and if you do some kind of a function and inside you do just some includes, who knows what is actually affected, uh, what is actually affected by. 
Um, and of course, the third point is obvious, and I hope we all don't do that, but still, ill-formed includes are evil. <coughs> because if you just open a header file in your ID and it's an ill-formed, what do you get? You get something. I could not predict. I couldn't even answer in advance what you get. You will get something. Um, and that's actually quite tough, but there is a very good thing that could help us, and I hope for it very much, and these are modelers. Because modelers is what, uh, when I was talking about Java imports, it's a very similar idea. So you know exactly what you're going to get while you will be importing these things. You know this kind of interface, you know that you will be getting this kind of shiny function that will do that stuff, and it has that kind of signature. And for us, it looks like a very good solution. That's why for us, like the models are the second thing after the concept that we're really looking for. So um, here I talked about like models and uh, concepts and if concepts were that we already have, uh, like I, I, sh I say already have, it's C++ 17, but like it's nearly here. So and C++ core guidelines, I would like to talk a couple of minutes more about them. So, because I think they are important, uh, because from one point they just improve the readability and they help to uh, they they help to make your code more readable, <laughs> thus maintainable, and it also helps the IDE, and that's a very good thing. And we see lots of good points there. So, uh, what we need actually to do from our side, we need to help you to push them to your code, and that's what we actually try to do and trying to push concepts uh, further to your everyday development. And just with that, um, we just put them actually into the ID with the help of Clank Tidy. So uh, you could just see, our, so if we're talking about uh, C-Line in particular, uh, we just uh, push the uh, C++ query guidelines via Clank Tidy there. So we just uh, uh, embed the Clank Tidy tool completely. And so we just show all the warnings that the Clank Tidy got um, into the editor window, including the C++ core guidelines. Yes, Clank Tidy doesn't get that many things from the C++ core guidelines, but I really hope that it will evolve and the IDE will catch up automatically. So that's just, you need just to contribute to Clank Tidy and the IDE will be catching up with the checks. And that also means that you could implement your custom ones, which Clank Tidy is a perfect tool for. So, and you could also get them automatically on board. And that's the task we have to do in uh, tools, like we have to support you with the tools that will be just uh, helping you pushing these things from the language. So that's about C++ core guidelines. And a very quick note about the C++ ecosystem um, in general. I was talking about it in more details at ACC or like a month ago, I guess. So, uh, but I won't be talking much here. So, but I want to just to pay you a little bit of your attention here. So, because when we're looking at the language, we're not looking only at the language features and what are coming, what is good, what is bad, but we are also looking at what the ecosystem exists uh, of so and if we're talking about ecosystems they are build systems there are compilers they are unit testing frameworks coding styles dependency managers we still like we finally have something um, and i talk about kernel here of course um, so the issue that we issues actually that we see with the ecosystem is that because it like it's more than 30 years for the language and there are lots of tools in the ecosystem and that's fantastic because you could find a tool for your particular need but there is uh, small issues here that not all the tools are quite convertible and not all the tools are um, could just uh, do the same things they don't have some common api so uh, and actually if we just take for example the compilers they actually evolve at different paces so they catch up with the standard features differently at different speed and sometimes they even have the different implementation for the features and why this is a problem for the tool guess what we have to behave on the project the same way your compiler does because otherwise you don't need that tool why do you need an IDE that behaves differently from the compiler you're gonna use so what that means we need to get what which compiler are you using which features it supports and how 
what is the difference with other compilers and we have to show you with this information. And sometimes this is an issue because the like while the compilers are catching up quite quickly with the latest standards, at least right now, uh, that's a very good thing. But they still uh, like catching up with, they are starting with different things, they are doing things different in general. And they even have the different uh, interface for us getting some kind of an information from the compiler. So, and there is a very similar things with uh, other tools in the ACA systems as well, like the build system that are, we have thousands of them. We don't have some kind of a standard here. Like the, you know, the iOS community, they are pretty much straightforward. They have like the vendor, they have the, they have the build system standard defector, they have compiler defector, whatever. They have their own problems, but they could actually deal with the tools much easier because they, you always know what to expect from the tools in this ecosystem. And here you just have different things that are hardly, hardly convertible into each other and don't have some kind of a general API. And I would really hope that the tools that we have in the ecosystem are more talking to each other and more making things in a similar way so that we all could benefit from what they provide. So I think that's it from my side. So I promise not to spend lots of time on the ecosystem. So, but I have some time for the questions. Are yeah. all those tools, analysis, themselves written in C++? Uh, it depends. So the question was, uh, are these old tools and analysis are written in C++? So I will uh, just uh, answer about the tools that we do. So uh, we do a couple of tools for C++, so it's uh, not that one ID. And so we have the C line and app code that are based on IntelliJ platform and it's Java platform. And it has uh, some sense of Kotlin there as well. So uh, we are trying to do some parts in C++, but more like an experimental mode, not some kind of a production code yet. But if we take the ReSharp C++ as an extension for Visual Studio, it's different. It's written in C Sharp, but it has the language engine written in C++ CLI. So, but yeah, that's, that's currently our reality. So we, we actually have, uh, I could talk more a little bit about uh, maybe something related to this question. So um, there is, Quite often we are asked why we are not using the libclang that is like a perfect tool and it's a tool that is quite close so it's somewhere on the way between the compiler and the IDE but the problem is that it's still on the way <laughs> like it's not yet there so uh, we are not using it uh, par partially because of the, some historical reasons because we have like 17 years for the platform in Java that is quite rich uh, in terms of the features and we just need to implement like a parser and then tune the features to adapt them to the like each language. But um, still currently we are in Java and Kotlin, but we hope that we could maybe try more things in C++. So that's the current answer. Yeah. This isn't so much a C++ question as a, sure. um, an ID behavioral question. Um, I had the, the misfortune to deal with a, uh, a code base where they were using GCC, but the toolchain didn't matter as much as the fact that um, they were using the same files in different uh, libraries that they were constructing. Mm -hmm. And they were not segregating where the object files went. So as the compiler went from one set of library files to another set of library files, it would detect that it had already built the file Mm -hmm. and reuse it. Unfortunately, the libraries were using separate preprocessor symbols to, to temper the, the headers that were being included in both. And what would end up happening is you'd get this, this horrible mismatch in the executable um, that you wouldn't detect until it crashed on you and then kind of traced it back to the fact that, oh, I just pulled an object and, and used it because I wasn't segregating by default. Um, does JetBrains do anything to be able to, to notice programmers stupid? <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to repeat the question shortly uh, for the recording. So the question was, uh, so if we deal with, uh, for example, a couple of libraries that are using uh, the same uh, code and the, like, the compiler tried to optimize a little bit and to just use what it has already compiled, but because of a different set of preprocessor, uh, preprocessor uh, variables, so you got actually a problem. So uh, the question was if uh, we could deal somehow with that. So um, 
Good question, actually, uh, and good point and a good feature request, probably. So I don't think we could uh, deal with it correctly, just because we, we could be confused as well. Uh, but, or maybe not, because like, we, we, we actually won't be doing the job, like we won't be taking the compiler results, so we won't be just doing the same thing as the compiler. We'll be just trying to parse the code as we can, like taking all the compiler flags and taking all these, what we have from the processor. But uh, I'm not sure if we really deal with it absolutely correctly, um, because I need to, to check the exact problem, so the exact project, so it could be yes or no, depending on, on the project, so. Uh, but that could be actually a good thing. Like, I should think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so, on your list of, of sort of the roles that you thought a, 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 an IDE could play with your correctness, performance, et cetera, um, I didn't see two there that I was kind of expecting, and that was debugging and profiling. What, um, do, you, what, yeah. what do you think? I actually, uh, so the question was that I had a list of what you expect from the ID. I will try to find that slide yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. So here is it. So, and uh, so since the Bruce didn't find here like some things about debugger and profiling, he was asking like uh, if we uh, think about it. Yes, of course we think about it. And it's actually hidden somewhere in this list. So I just not uh, try not to put a really big list taking all the slides. So of course it's uh, actually, it's more things here. So, and. Partially, it's in the last point with other tools on board because what we try to do is we try to take the compilers that I, uh, sorry, debuggers that I use by the community like GDB and LLDB and just provide our own front ends for these debuggers and what uh, work with what the community is usually working with. So not trying to create our own debugger. So um, we currently don't have any profiler tools for C++ on board, but we had some requests on integrating for what the, actually the community is using. So this more falling onto the last point here. So, but I just try to avoid it, not because it's not, not that important to the topic. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Yeah, sure. Um, this is kind of coming out of the, 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 the whole area of uh, providing the IntelliSense-like uh, feature. Uh, one of the big problems of IntelliSense, or just that kind of uh, helpful hints for the developers, it takes a while to assemble the database. Mm -hmm. And there's been, because of, the, I guess, the history of within Visual Studio, that that has been prob problematic, depending on your code base, that people have just basically turned it off and said, you know, if it's, if it's just going to take this long or it's going to be wrong because it doesn't have all the, the data assembled, then let's just shut it off. Can JetBrains actually turn off IntelliSense for those people who say, I'm not going to use this because it has IntelliSense and it's going to be slow? Yeah, so the question was that sometimes the IntelliSense really takes time and so you really would like some time to shut it out, uh, like and to shut it off and to just to, to do some work, actually. So... Uh, there is, uh, the quick question is, uh, first of all, so yes, we could shut off some things, so we could turn off the code analysis completely, so there is an option for that. Uh, so the thing that we could not turn off is the, uh, like, the parsing that is happening in the background for your code, because uh, we believe that we could not, like, highlight or format the code without that, and that's the thing that we, uh, we can't turn off, because without that, you could just take the text editor, you know, so if, if the ID is not highlighting and formatting your code correctly on the fly, then you just go to text editor no need to use the ID and turn turn it off there so uh, we try to put these things to the background so that they do not interact your work and so if you still trying to call some functions explicitly like uh, I was uh, somewhere showing here doesn't matter so uh, if you try to call some uh, functions implicitly like navigation or whatever, of course you have to wait until it finishes some tasks, but with uh, code highlighting and uh, uh, formatting, so it's just doing some things in the background and if you are happy enough and this particular file just, uh, this particular place is uh, finished, so you just got everything done, but we don't provide any option to turn these things off completely because there is uh, some basic things which the ID is here for. Like, Okay. Any more questions? We still have some minutes. 
Okay, then thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.